This is Pastor Adam Fannin at Law of Liberty Baptist Church here in Jacksonville, Florida. Today, I want to share a special interview with you with Pastor Tim DeVries from Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. That's near Louisville, and he is an independent, fundamental, King James-only Baptist who is also non-dispensational, non-Calvinist, and he's non-Zionist. I want to share this special interview with you where we begin to open up the scriptures and compare the difference between the wrath of God, which is judgment, and tribulation that comes upon the world, and more specifically, persecution that comes upon Christianity. Now, most Christians today teach and believe that Christians will not see any persecution from the Antichrist in the end times. And they do it based on a man-made doctrine, and their proof verse is that we are not appointed unto wrath. Well, that verse is 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and in 1 Thessalonians 3, it says that we are appointed to affliction and persecution and tribulation. So if Jesus told us that we're going to see persecution and tribulation in our days, and especially the end of days, I think we would be wise to throw out the man-made doctrine and just listen to the scriptures. This is the goal of this podcast, and especially this interview, that you would open up the Bible for yourself and prove all things. Be a Berean. Be one of the Christians that prove these things out of the Bible. Don't just believe what you've heard, but you can believe what you read. Without further ado, let's take a look here. Pastor Tim DeVries, if you would, sir, please tell us the difference between tribulation and persecution according to the scriptures. Well, the the first thing, the most important thing to understand is that there is a big difference between tribulation and wrath. Um, A lot of what uh, is God's wrath being poured out on this earth has been billed as tribulation or as the tribulation or the great tribulation. And you're never going to find anywhere in the Bible where it says there's a seven years tribulation or capital T tribulation. What you need to understand is the term tribulation is a very simple general term, a term that means trouble. It means trouble. And uh, some synonyms for tribulation are affliction and persecution. You know, John 16, 33, Jesus said, in the world, ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And of course, when we're speaking of tribulation, typically we're talking about the end times. You know, when when does Jesus return in the air for his saints? And by the way, again, remember saints, the elect, those are believers of all nations of all ages. That's very important to understand. But I want you to see a synonym in the Bible. The Bible defines itself, Matthew 24, 21, It's talking about the end times. It says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no nor ever shall be. Now, don't get confused and think great tribulation. That's Oh, that's that second three and a half years of that seven-year time period. I know that's what a lot of charts say. But you need to understand, again, tribulation is talking about trouble, affliction, persecution. There's going to be trouble around the world, but primarily he's referring to persecution of Christians. And so I want you to see a, a, a word he uses here in Mark 13, um, verse 19, it says, For in those days, speaking of the same time period, in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And if you go down verse 24, remember the Bible defines itself. If you'll read the Bible in context, it will show you uh, what, what the word means. And so right after he says in verse 19, he calls it affliction in Mark 13. In verse 24, he says, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. It's the same thing in Matthew 24 when it says immediately after the tribulation of those days. So it's saying tribulation and affliction, they're the same thing. Um, if you read further, uh, the Bible talks about persecution. You know, many, many folks quote, we're not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, amen. We're not appointed unto wrath. You know, Jesus suffered the wrath of God for us on the old rugged cross. In fact, that's uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. It says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's absolutely true. But here's what you need to understand. Again, there's a difference between tribulation and wrath. Tribulation is trouble. It's persecution. It's affliction. Wrath is vehement, hot, intense anger. And typically when we're referring to end times, it's talking about God's wrath 
against a wicked world that's been murdering and martyring his children. You know, I, I want you to think if somebody had been giving your children trouble and affliction and persecution, how would you feel? How would you think? You wouldn't just put up with that. Well, there's a point where God is going to say enough is enough. And what's going to happen, this world is going to persecute in a great way His children. Great tribulation. Worldwide tribulation. Widespread tribulation. Persecution and affliction. What's going to happen? We're going to be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And immediately the same day, the Lord is going to pour out His wrath upon a world that loves blood, that loves persecution and trouble for God's children. And so... 1 Thessalonians 5 says, we're not appointed unto wrath. And that's right, we're not. But what are we appointed to? Well, you have to go back to the same book. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, he says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. So no, we're not appointed unto wrath, but we are appointed unto affliction. And again, what's, what are synonyms for affliction? Tribulation, persecution. He says, verse four, uh, verse 4, For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass. And you know, and you say, but wait a minute, Pastor, what about the tribulation? Again, I want to help you understand. There's no capital T tribulation, time period called the tribulation. Now, Jesus said there's going to be tribulation, persecution, affliction, and then there is going to be great tribulation, affliction, and persecution, more widespread. But we need to understand God's timeline. Um, you know, what's the classic rapture passage? I mean, tell me which, which passage say, hey, this shows the rapture of the church. And I, and I believe in the rapture of the church. I do. I believe we are going to be caught up in the air to uh, meet the Lord in the clouds. And uh, so shall we ever be with the Lord. I believe we're coming back with the Lord to this earth. He's going to set his feet down on the Mount of Olives. But I want you to think which verse is used to teach the rapture of the church. Well, it's typically which one? 1 Thessalonians 4. So let's look at it. 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, we, we need to see that the terms we use really have an effect. Okay, A lot of times people hear the term coming of the Lord and they say, oh no, that's not the rapture because that's when Jesus comes back the second time and touches down on the Mount of Olives with his children. Folks, what I'm telling you is that most of the time when the Bible talks about the coming of the Lord, it's actually the rapture. It's what we've called the rapture. So let's think of the classic rapture passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the, and listen to what God calls it, unto the coming of the Lord. What is he talking about here? He's talking about what we have called the rapture. And by the way, why do we call it the rapture? I'll get there in a minute in this passage. But notice, we which are alive and remain, God's word calls it, God calls it the coming of the Lord. When we meet him in the air, that's the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up. That's where we get the word rapture, caught up. Together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now notice, the comfort is not that we're not going to face tribulation, affliction, or persecution. The comfort is we're going to be forever with the Lord. Whatever tribulation, affliction, persecution we deal with here, it is only temporary. And uh, God, we're, we're on the winning side. But understand, again, when God talks about the coming of the Lord, most of the time he's referring to what we've called the rapture. When Jesus Christ comes in the air, we're caught up with him. Uh, later on, 1 Thessalonians 5, just continue on into the next chapter. He says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Say, See right there, Pastor, it's a thief in the night. You know, the day of the Lord's coming, we're going to just be taken out of here and suddenly disappear. It's not what the Bible says. Don't miss this. You have to read the whole context. It, you, you'll get really confused if you just read one verse here and one verse there. Just pick the ones that support your position. What you really need to do is read the whole context. You need to read every verse in this passage. So, 
He goes right from talking about the rapture, what God's word calls the coming of the Lord. He says, of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. What does that mean? It's going to sneak up on people. They're not going to be aware of it. Verse 3, for when they shall say, well, who? The lost world. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Verse 4, but ye, brethren, believers, if you're paying attention, if you are believing what God's word says, ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. We, we don't know the day or the hour. In fact, anyone who says they do, they haven't read their Bible carefully enough. They, they, they've gotten too heady and high-minded. We don't know the day or the hour, but we can certainly know the season. There are things Jesus told us to look for. Um, notice, he says, You're all children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Verse 9, God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. God's Word teaches an order over and over and over again. It teaches the same order of how events are going to happen. And I want to show you this in Matthew 24. Um, this order, and again, we could go to Mark 13, we can go to Luke 17, and Luke 21, and Revelation 6, and, and 1 Thessalonians, and 2 Thessalonians, they all match. They do. Uh, the reason most people are so confused about these passages is they're trying to force a viewpoint they learned into those passages instead of simply reading what the passages say. So I want you to notice that I'm going to work backwards in this chapter, okay? So in Matthew 24... There are some classic verses here that we're talking about are the rapture, right? And, and you can't just lift these out of the text. You can't just say, hey, this is, this is the rapture, but then none of, this, none of these other uh, verses are talking about the rapture. So look what this says, Matthew 24, uh, verse 44. Therefore be also ready. Ready for what? What, what? what are we supposed to be ready for? The rapture. What God's word calls the coming of the Lord, Okay. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Okay, same terminology as 1 Thessalonians 4. We're talking about the rapture. Listen to verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. What are we talking about here? What is he talking about? He's talking about what we have called the rapture, what God's Word calls the coming of the Lord. Uh, notice verse 36. Of that day and hour. What day and hour? Well, he tells us before this what day and hour he's talking about, but we're talking about the same day and hour throughout this whole passage. We're talking about the, what we've called the rapture, the day Jesus Christ comes in the air, in the clouds for his people. We are taken out of here. He's going to come as a thief in the night. The lost world, he's going to sneak up on the lost world. But those of us who are of the day, uh, we're not in darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. But notice verse 36, of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Again, what day is he talking about? Well, back up further in the passage. And what does he talk about? Verse uh, 30, it says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Say, wait a minute, Pastor, that's the coming of the Lord. That's when he sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives. No, no, no. Don't forget what 1 Thessalonians 4 called what we have called the rapture. What did he call it? The coming of the Lord. So get out of your mind this thought that the coming of the Lord means when Jesus sets his feet on the Mount of Olives. Yes, in Scripture that is mentioned sometimes, but most of the time. What is he talking about? What we've called the rapture. So listen to this and tell me if it describes the rapture. It does, but listen. It says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Does that sound like 1 Thessalonians 4? It does. And they shall gather together his elect. So wait a minute. That's, there it is, the elect. Those are the Jews. Well, that's a whole other topic for another day. But I'm just going to tell you right now, you dig through every passage. I challenge you to do this. Dig through every passage where the elect are mentioned. And here's what you're going to find. You're going to find the elect are believers of all nations. Praise God. It's me. I'm, I'm part of the elect. You're part of the elect. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are the elect. You are the Israel of God. 
We didn't pr replace the physical nation of Israel. The physical nation of Israel was a picture of the church all along. Just like Jesus didn't replace the high priest. The high priest was a picture of Jesus all along. Jesus didn't replace the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb was a picture of Jesus all along. You can find types like that all through the Bible that God placed there to help us understand eternal truth just as with the physical nation of Israel. We, the church, did not replace the physical nation of Israel. We are the Israel of God, as Paul said in Galatians. Romans 2, 28, 29, he's not a Jew which is one outwardly. He's a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is not that of the flesh, but that which is of the heart. Um, you know, they are not all Israel which are of Israel. What in the world does that mean? It means not everybody who's of the physical nation of Israel are the people of God. You are the people of God doesn't matter what nation you're from, if you've believed on the cornerstone, the Lord Jesus Christ. You're a spiritual nation. Uh, you know, and so when he talks about t taking up his elect, these are believers. That's who it is, believers. So again, I'm going to read this. It's describing what we've called the rapture. It says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So wait a minute. There's a problem. The rapture, we suddenly disappear. No, no, we don't. I'm going to get there in just a minute. There's no verse in the Bible that says we suddenly disappear. There isn't one. Now, I'm going to take you to that passage in just a minute. But notice verse 31. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Keep reading. He says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know... That summer is nigh. What's he talking about? A season. Summer is a season. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, all what things? Well, all the things I'm about to read to you from the beginning of Matthew 24. When ye shall see all these things, uh, know that it is near, even at the doors. In Luke, he says, lift up your heads, your redemption draweth nigh. Um, he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. These things won't take generations to happen. It'll happen in one generation. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What day is he talking about? What we've called the rapture, the coming of the Lord. But as, and it says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Notice again, what is he talking about? what we have called the rapture. He calls it the coming of the Lord. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 42, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. You can't say that verse is talking about when he comes back later and sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, but this one now suddenly again is back to talking about the coming in the air. He's talking about the same event. Um, l listen, this is the order. And again, if you go to Matthew 24, and I, I challenge you to compare these scriptures. You know, put away your prophecy books. This is the prophecy book, okay? All of those books were supposed to come from this book, all right? But this book is not flawed. Those books are. So put away all your prophecy books. You know, pull out your Bible. The Holy Spirit of God is in you. He can show you the truth. So if you will commit to studying the Bible, if you'll commit to what he said, he'll show you the truth. So l listen to what he says. Matthew 24, the disciples asked him, they said, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, and again, don't get confused. You hear the word coming. First Thessalonians 4, the rapture. What is it called? The coming of the Lord. Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. Why would he say that? Because it'd be easy to be deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars. So listen to the timeline. This timeline matches throughout the Bible. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences, think viruses, and earthquakes in divers places. Well, we hear about all that stuff right now. I think it will increase more and more as we get closer to the time, but we're, we hear those things every day now. Verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Well, what, what are synonyms for affliction? Again, study it out. Tribulation, persecution. 
We are appointed to affliction. We are appointed to persecution. We are appointed to tribulation. We are not appointed to wrath. He said, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. So this is tribulation. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. And then notice he, he speaks about a signature event here in verse 15. Okay, this is an event. It's not just a general event. This is a very specific event. Verse 15, he says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. The bottom line, here's what's going to happen. The man of sin, otherwise known as the Antichrist, is going to come to power. He is going to lead the world politically. Who's standing in his way? I'll tell you who's standing in his way. All Bible believers are standing in his way. All people who not only love the name of Jesus, but love his word are standing in his way. And so, yes, there's been persecution, tribulation to this point, but now there's going to come great tribulation, great persecution. Uh, understand what this abomination of desolation is. This Antichrist is going to stand up he is going to receive, he's going to have a deadly wound and be healed, literally rise from the dead. Some people think, no, he doesn't literally rise from the dead. I think he literally rises from the dead. God allows him to. And then the false prophet tells everybody, hey, this is the man we should be following, folks. He rose from the dead. I mean, this is probably the Christ. He rose from the dead. Look at these works, these wonders. Follow him. And by the way, we're going to set up an image to him. Don't forget, the Antichrist is not God. He can't be everywhere at one time. Neither can the devil, okay? But there's going to be an image set up to him, and everybody is going to be commanded to worship him and to receive a mark in their hands or in their forehead. And notice, every time that mark is mentioned, it is always tied to the worship of the beast, who is the Antichrist. And it's also the system the Antichrist leads. So he's talking about a very specific event. We, we could waste all year. We could sell a lot of books trying to tell people who the Antichrist is, and frankly, we, we'd just be misleading people. Because the time we will know who the Antichrist is, is when this man of sin rises to power after he's risen from the dead, will demand to be worshipped, and there will be an image set forth to him that speaks, that moves, and the beast and the false prophet, rather, the false prophet will point people to the beast to worship him. Uh, as a matter of fact, so again, this is in this timeline, the abomination of desolation. Um, in 2 Thessalonians, Paul talks about this. And uh, he said that that day of Christ shall not come. Speaking of the rapture. Now, now listen to this passage. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, hold on. When you think of the word coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, do not think most of the time about Him putting His feet down on the Mount of Olives. We're talking about Him in the air. What we have called the what? The rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, the coming. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us. Don't miss this. As that the day of Christ is at hand. What is he talking about? The rapture. Look, I'm looking for Jesus Christ. I'm looking. For, he is my blessed hope. I'm looking forward to when Jesus Christ comes. I just know there are things Jesus said have to happen first. He told us what to look for. He told us how we would know the season when He is coming. So notice that they were, people had thought they had missed Christ's coming. Others were troubling them, telling them so. And listen to what Paul writes to this church in Thessalonica. He says, let no man deceive you. By any means, for that day shall not come. What day? What day are they looking for? They're not looking for him to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. They're looking for him to take us out of this world. That day, the rapture, the coming of the Lord, shall not come, notice, except there come a falling away first. Now that is literally talking about apostasy. False doctrine, falling away from truth. Say, Pastor, that's happening now. Well, I agree with you. It is happening to some degree, but I think it's going to keep happening in a much greater way where the whole world is going to buy into this falsehood uh, that is being promoted by the beast and the false prophet. 
So that day, though, when Christ comes in the air, will not come except there come a falling away first, but then don't leave out the next part of the verse. It says, and that man of sin be revealed. Did you notice that? The day of Christ won't come until this, the man of sin is revealed. How is he revealed? We just read it in Matthew 24. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Whoso readeth, let him understand. You know what? True Bible believers are going to see this man of sin stand up and say, hey, I'm the one and he's risen from the dead and the false prophet's going to say, worship him. And real Bible believers are going to go, oh, he's the one. <laughs> he's the one that... And, and now look, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I am looking for Jesus Christ. But I simply know what Jesus said has to happen first. Jesus said that man of sin is going to be revealed. By the way, he's a loser. He, he, he loses, okay? But notice... That man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed. Who might be revealed? The Antichrist in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. What does that mean? What did John say? There are already many antichrists in the world, right? That, that mindset, that system is already here. That man of sin may even already be here. We don't know, but we will know when he is elevated uh, to take that position of saying, hey, worship me. But notice, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. I know, I know what you've heard. That's the Holy Spirit. First of all, are you going to take the Holy Spirit out of the world? Are you going to take Him out of the way? God is in every place. You're not going to remove Him. Though I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. Though I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Secondly, to say that's the Holy Spirit of God, you're taking this out of context. There's nowhere in this chapter that even mentions the Holy Spirit. Nowhere. Uh, and by the way, if that were true, then why would it say, you know, the Holy Ghost shall give you in that hour what ye shall say? If He's gone... What, what I'm just telling you is that's something somebody forced into that passage to try to make it fit with what they believe. The same goes with uh, verse, uh, verse 3. There, man, there are preachers who have twisted that verse till it screams. They've changed the truth. And where it says, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. They said, oh, no, that really means a snatching away or a catching away. Like, oh, that's the rapture. Well, then why didn't it say that? It doesn't say that. It says a falling away first. That's apostasy. And that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. And notice he says, The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. It's very interesting how the Bible describes this in Revelation. This is the beast that, that was, and uh, it, he is, he was, and he will be again. I'm not quoting it exactly, but the point is this. That Antichrist, he's going to be wounded to death. He will rise from the dead. He will be able to perform signs and miracles. So will the false prophet. And they'll deceive many people into following them. And they'll demand to be worshipped. They'll demand that you get a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. Not everybody has a right hand. So they're going to demand that worship. And the mark of the beast is always tied to that. You can't buy or sell without that mark. But notice, he will be revealed. It says, verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, but good news, whom the Lord will will uh, shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And by the way, notice this pattern. God offers them the love of the truth. God offers people truth, but we have a free will. What do we do? We can accept that truth, believe it, act upon it, or we can reject it. And what happens when they reject that truth? Then God sends them a strong delusion. You know, you think in the Bible about all the people who harden their hearts against hot God, harden their heart, harden their heart. What does God do eventually? He hardens their heart. He closes the door. I think of Noah's Ark. Noah was building that ark. What was it, 120 years? Building. He wasn't just building. He was preaching while he built. And people thought he was crazy. Guess what? That invitation to get on that ark wasn't forever. Because eventually, who closed the door? God closed the door. What's going to happen 
The Bible says, For this cause, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So Matthew 24, Jesus says, what's going to happen? Here's the order. Again, compare this. Go compare this to Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21, Revelation 6, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. Compare these, all of these. They match up. The only reason it's confusing is if you try to fit what you believe first into the Bible. Just go to the Bible, read what it says. Just simply see what it says. And, and notice what he says happens after the abomination of desolation. He says, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Why Judea? This is the epicenter. Remember again, the Antichrist is not God. As a matter of fact, the Bible speaks of his kingdom that will be partly strong, partly broken. So the, the, the Bible talks about in Daniel how that at the end times these will be nations. They're still going to be individual nations. It's not necessarily that this is a one world government as in it's one big nation. No, there are multiple nations who are going to give their power to the Antichrist. They're going to loosely be joined together. And so the beast is not going to have complete dominion. There are going to be parts of weakness in his kingdom. But for the most part, he is going to rule and reign over the world. God is going to allow him that. Now notice, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Why? Again, you need to get out of there. You need to flee. Verse 18, either let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child, to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why? That's going to slow down and hinder you. Why? Verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation. Tribulation, what is it? Affliction, persecution. Led by whom? By the beast by this satanically, uh, 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 this man operating in the power of Satan who is going to want to destroy God's people. Who are God's people? Believers of all physical nations. We are the elect. We are the Israel of God. Notice he says, then shall be great tribulation. By the way, it won't just be believers suffering though. The whole world will suffer because of this wicked man's rule. And notice it says, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, who is that? Believers, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, but it's not. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is in us. They shall deceive the very elect, but they won't. We will we'll know because of what God's Word says, because of the Holy Ghost in us. Verse 25, Behold, I have told you before, wherefore if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Notice this. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The lightning. You go outside and you see lightning in the sky. You can see it all over. I mean, it doesn't matter where you're standing. You look, look up and you'll see it. What is it saying? It's highly visible. What is he saying? The coming of the Son of Man will be highly visible. I thought we suddenly disappear. I'm getting there just a minute. We don't suddenly disappear. Secondly, when he says the coming of the Son of Man, remember biblically, what is he talking about? Get out of your mind the idea that the coming means when Jesus puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. Most of the time, what's he talking about? In this passage, what is he talking about? What we have called the rapture. He says, as the lightning cometh out of the east, shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. By the way, that's why in Revelation 6, the kings of the earth, the people who've been in places of power, who've been persecuting God's children, murdering and martyring them, are going to tremble. Why? Because they're about to face the wrath of the Lamb. They're about to face the wrath of God as He pours out His wrath upon a world that's been hurting and harming His children. Notice verse 28, it's, it's just saying the same thing in another way figurative language. It says, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. If you've ever been outside and you look up and you see a bunch of eagles circling or buzzards circling, it's highly visible. No matter where you are, it's highly visible. In the same way, it's going to be highly visible when Jesus Christ comes. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Get out of your mind seven years tribulation. The Bible doesn't say that. After those days, Jesus just described of trouble, affliction, and persecution. After those days, immediately after the days of tribulation, 
shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear. Notice that's a key word. The sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What day? What we've called the rapture, what God's word calls the coming of the Lord. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Is he talking about when he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives? No. He's talking about the rapture, the coming of the Lord, what God's word calls the coming of the Lord. Verse 44, therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Say, Pastor, are you sure we don't suddenly disappear? I know we don't suddenly disappear. Let me explain that quickly. There's a lot of verses to go to, but I want you to remember when Jesus had risen from the dead and He's about to ascend up into heaven. He gave His disciples a command, and by the way, it's the same command we still have. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be what? witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. That's still our job. We're still supposed to be being a witness. But then what happened? Christ ascended up into heaven. The disciples stood there. If you ever let a balloon go off in the air, what do you do? You sit there and you go. And that's what the disciples were doing. And suddenly the Bible says, two men, I'll just read it to you, Acts chapter 1. Uh, it says, uh, notice, Acts chapter 1. Verse 11, they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, notice this, this is important. Every word in the Bible is there on purpose. It means something, okay? God doesn't waste words. So it says, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. So how did he go up? He went up. In a cloud, he went up and it was highly visible. They watched him going up. When he returns again, the world will see him coming. Revelation 1, and you need to understand again what that's talking about. Notice Revelation 1. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And I've heard preachers twist this passage. Say, no, it means every saved eye. Then why didn't God say that? He said, every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Well, no, I think we suddenly disappear. Well, let's read. What, what verse tells us we suddenly disappear? Which one? Well, the one that gets used is 1 Corinthians 15. That is about the resurrection. By the way, that's the same event. When you talk about the rapture, it's the first resurrection. It's the same thing, the coming of the Lord. What's going to happen? Well, we already read that in 1 Thessalonians 4, that we which are alive and remain of the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. It's the same event. The rapture, what the Bible calls the coming of the Lord, or the first resurrection. Now, so 1 Corinthians 15 is all about that first resurrection. Paul was writing to the church in Corinth because there were some people who were saying, well, there is no resurrection. And by the way, in the beginning of that chapter, uh, don't mistake that to think, well, you can lose your salvation. That's not what this is saying. When he says, I've preached the gospel unto you, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. A lot of people, oh, you can believe in vain. You can believe on Christ, but it can be in vain. That's not what he's saying. Look, if you believe that there's no resurrection, you have believed in vain. Because it's not just the death and burial of Jesus Christ that saves us. He had to rise from the dead. That's Paul's point. You've believed in vain if you haven't believed the full gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's what his, that's what his topic is, this whole chapter. Okay? So with that in mind, we get to 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, notice, this is the verse that gets used to say, we just suddenly disappear. So notice, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be what? Changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. What's going to happen in the moment in the twinkling of an eye? We're going to suddenly disappear. It's not what it says. It says in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be changed. 
What's the twinkling of an eye? It's not the blink of an eye. It's, it's literally that glint of light. When you look at somebody's eye and you see that flash of light off their eye, GE did a measurement years ago. It was like one thirtieth of a second. I mean, it's just, it's that fast. It's faster than that. He said, we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Nowhere. This is the verse that gets used to say we suddenly disappear. God's word says Jesus coming is highly visible and that we are going to rise to meet him in the air. What's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump will be changed for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Listen to 1 John 3. It also talks about what will happen at the coming of Christ. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. That's why we face persecution. That's why Jesus said, John 16, 33, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, have overcome the world. He said, If they hate me, they'll hate you. It shouldn't take us by surprise that we don't fit in this world. That this, we don't fit in this world system. We're God's children. Notice, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall, what's the word? Appear. Well, that means he's going to be visible. He's going to appear and not just to saved eyes. That's not what that verse said. Every eye shall see him. Notice, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hold on. When are we going to be like Jesus? Are we talking about later when he comes down on the Mount of Olives? No, we're talking about the rapture of the church, what God's word calls the coming of the Lord. We're going to meet him in the air. We are going to be changed and be like Christ. Notice, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So again, I just want you to see, it's very important to understand, there's a big difference between tribulation and wrath. A big difference. We're not appointed unto wrath. Jesus suffered the wrath of God for us on the old rugged cross. But we are appointed unto tribulation, persecution, and affliction. Paul said in Timothy, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's very plain. First and Second Peter are books all about that, where people were literally being burned to death at the stake because they were standing for Jesus Christ. Should we somehow escape tribulation, affliction, and persecution while other believers suffer? Uh, you know, it's not very hard for believers in many nations to believe what God's Word simply says that we're going to face persecution because they already are. You know, we experienced just a very small taste of that when COVID happened. We're still having church when we're commanded not to have church. So our neighbors were taking pictures of us and the news shows up outside. Oh, we're being persecuted. Well, were we really? I mean, you know, our building wasn't bulldozed. None of us got killed. None of our kids got taken away. What I'm saying is that is literally happening, happening in nations right now. We are going to face tribulation and persecution. Say, so why is that important to know? Well, first of all, because it's truth. I mean, that's what God's Word says. Jesus said, I'm coming, but here's what you need to know is going to happen first. And I'm telling you this so you won't be offended. You know, if you believe what, um, hey, hey, we're just going to be out of here before any trouble happens. I'm going to be out of here. I won't have to pay my taxes. You know, I'm going to be out of here. And so I'll just wait for Jesus to sort it all out. Well, He is going to sort it all out. But there's some stuff we need to be aware we're going to go through. In fact, in Peter, he says to arm ourselves with that mind to suffer. As a matter of fact, the verse we use that talks about following Jesus Christ, when it says to follow his steps, look it up. What's he talking about? Suffering. He's talking about suffering for Christ. I'm simply saying we need all of the Bible. All scriptures are given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. You know, say, I, I don't prefer this. doesn't matter what we prefer. What matters is what God's truth is. That's what matters. We need to be prepared, understanding what God's Word says, that we are appointed unto tribulation, affliction, persecution. We are appointed unto that. We're not appointed unto wrath. Jesus suffered that for us. So I hope if you have any questions, you'll go to the Bible. Don't just take my word for it. Don't take any preacher's word for it. Go to the Bible. 
Be a Berean Christian, Acts 17, 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind. But then what did they do? They searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Don't, don't search your prophecy study books. They'll lead you astray. I've read many a prophecy study book that says, well, it might be this, or it might be that, or it might be that. Look, and it'll leave you more confused than when you began. Just go to the Bible. Go to the Bible. You don't need to be a PhD to understand the Bible. You just need to have a commitment to study the Word of God. Be a saved, born-again believer of the Holy Ghost of God living inside of you and spend time in the Word of God. And you can understand it. No prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. You can understand it. So I hope, uh, hope you'll do well as you study God's Word to see the truth of these matters. Thank you, Pastor DeVries. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope it's an encouragement, and I trust that you will take the Word of God as your highest authority. Get in the Scriptures for yourself. Prove it to yourself. The time is at hand. Let's get out and preach the gospel to the lost and quit arguing about when he's coming, and let's talk about the fact that he is coming, and he warned us that we would see the Antichrist. Therefore, before persecution comes, while we're free in America, let's get out there and preach the gospel and see some souls saved for God's glory. I hope this is a blessing to you. I hope you're having a great week. God bless. Take care.